Hey everyone, Nathan here, president of Saybrook University. Welcome to another episode of Saybrook Insights. Grief, death, and dying, heavy topics. Most of us have experienced the death of a loved one, a close friend or relative. The range of emotions we can feel go from emptiness to searing pain. And then there's no right way to grieve, despite what we're often told, whether it's from self-help gurus, religion, conventional wisdom, or, you know, that well-meaning advice from friends and family. I remember when my mentor in graduate school, Dr. Leo Kraskowski, died quite suddenly after a short battle with cancer. News of his death caught me and those who knew and loved him by surprise. He was just one of those people, right? He was, oh man, just brilliant kind, gentle, this is wicked, wicked sense of humor, a family man through and through, an accomplished former college president and dean of a major college of the University of California. And this guy took so much time out of his day as someone who didn't have to do it for his students. He was a mentor, a companion in the journey of my doctoral program. Uh, and he became like a second father to me. And so many others knew and loved him as well. As I contemplated his death, it really felt so unfair, so random, so absolutely incomprehensible that this kind of person, this great human being, dies too soon. While others who are less than good people seem to just thrive on, moving into their day and out of their day, nothing happening really. I was angry that he died. Not at him, but the incomprehensibility of it. His family and I met, we were close. And in that space, I could sense they were like so many going through the motions to just get through what had to be done. His wife, Marty, just heartbreakingly recounted that he died holding her hand, having said to her the night before he loved her, but it looked like it was the end. And he died at home in her embrace. And he knew, and he had made peace, but the rest of us were still trying to make sense of it all. She wasn't so ready to let him go. This is her person. And she too was grieving in her own way. And she knew he wasn't particularly religious. He definitely would not uh, subscribe to certain edicts of the Catholic Church, but she planned a Catholic burial for him. And this all made sense, and Leo would have been okay with that. I remember on the day of the funeral, I made my way over to the church, making it almost through the service when I had to excuse myself. I felt this incredible welling up, almost like I had to vomit. But what came out was this rush of tears and anguish. I was in the back of the narthex of the church. It was this anguish I hadn't felt before. And I had people who died. Many people in my family and my friend group had passed away. People I loved deeply and immensely. But this one, man, this was different for some reason. And I couldn't explain why. This was not how I was supposed to grieve, right? I, this was my professional mentor, someone uh, who had been like a second dad to me, but, you know, wasn't in that family group. Following the service after I pulled myself together, I drove home contemplating my response. Not long after Leo's death and his wife, Marty, died, falling victim to breast cancer and what most of us presumed to be a broken heart. And I found myself once again emoting in ways I had never done before. And I pushed these down deep into my inner psyche for a while, moving on, because if I held on to this, I didn't think I could have continued on. And I never really processed those feelings until really over the last few years. Over time, then, the thing started bubbling up and me thinking about these things. My reflections illuminated what probably isn't all that unusual. I felt a real sense of anger over the randomness of his death. And also in his death, there was a contemplation of my own very real mortality. How quickly death knocks and how rapidly we move on to the next thing in life. What then is grief all about? Why do we have more acute feelings in some instances than others? What the heck is grief anyway? How do we address the existential aspects of death while ensuring an honoring of the other in the fullest possible way? And as importantly, what can we do to be better stewards of the death and dying process, both for others and ourselves? Enter Gina Belton, faculty member in the College of Integrative Medicine and Health Sciences and 
Specialization Director for the Contemplative End-of-Life Care Specialization here at Saybrook University. Gina and I first talked about grief. I think it may have been the first episode of this entire podcast, at least in one of the first episodes. Today, she's built now an incredible concentration or specialization that really looks at death and dying and our work in that space very uniquely, holistically, and humanistically. We're going to cover some fascinating territory, so let's get to it with Dr. Gina Belton. Dr. Gina Belton, it is so fabulous to have you here today on Saybrook Insights. Before we get started, I'd like for you to talk about yourself. Round out for us your personal history, about your academic, your personal life, whatever you're comfortable sharing, and most of all, your journey to Saybrook University. Well... Thank you for the invitation. You remind me of a practice my grandfather often demonstrated to me when I was growing up. And if he met you for the first time, he would put his hands together and gently bow and say, Con permiso, a donde son? And he would ask you, with your permission, where are you from? And I uh, would, you know, even from the time I was a little girl, I just kind of marvel at that little practice when I'd watch him doing this. And his front yard when he'd meet somebody and realize, huh, that one was a little short, maybe five minutes. Oh, this one's going on for hours. Because those folks recognized that he wasn't asking what street you live on. He wanted to know, who are you? Who are your people? Where did you come from? What land are you being responsible to? Right? So, and ancestors and elders and the whole <laughs> collective <laughs> that are standing behind me right now. So that's a little bit about my um, indigenous background, if you will. I started out in nurse culture. Uh, and so that's uh, like most of my colleagues, it was secure, circuitous uh, route to Saybrook University, certainly not a straight line. And definitely once you arrive, everything continues to be a bit of an unfolding and an evolution and it reminds me of that phrase, I'd like to be as the river flows, marveling at my own unfolding. I really adore that. And that's kind of what's been happening since I arrived. I started out, though, before arriving at Saybrook, 20 years of an initiation in uh, nurse culture. And that was only because I knew I was born to be a midwife, because elders like my grandfather and others recognized my capacity to be close to suffering very close to suffering. And he was one of those close teachers as well. So there I was starting out my um, end of life midwifery, literally catching babies in nurse culture. Um, but I soon found out that that little white dress and those little white tights and that little white hat were too tight for me. <laughs> so I knew I wouldn't be there my whole life, but I did pay attention as I was taught to. You pay attention to those who have wisdom, those who have capacities, and, and those who are willing to share with you their gifts. And I have many, many talented nurse colleagues that I still cherish today who taught me a great deal, especially when I began literally catching babies with them and our physician colleagues. But in that time, you know, I, I did get to learn that through holding mothers who held their babies for the first time when they took their first and last breath, to holding whole families um, when the surgeon came out to say, I am so sorry, we did everything we could and your loved one didn't survive the uh, procedure. When I was an emergency room nurse, holding many, many family members in those traumatic experiences, morphing in this hand and titrating in the fluids in the other and this really gentle balance so it was just enough to hold while the rest of the family arrived to say goodbye. Uh, definitely some of the most sacred nursing I ever did was when I was a forensic nurse because I just didn't know I could be that still and that committed to uh, a kind of intimacy required for that work. Um, and in forensic work, uh, nursing, you're collecting uh, DNA evidence after an assault. So it all sounds kind of dramatic, doesn't it? But really, there was an awful lot of joy in all of that experience, um, a great deal of humor, 
so much learning. And so I, I finally, the initiation came to its end. I knew that and I went back to grad school and said, well, it's time to uh, differentiate, differentiate into psychology um, with the good graces and support of my mentor, Charles, Charles Garfield. He said, I think it's time. I said, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> because in the, in the space between that transition, you know, I, I was uh, holding all of those spaces with folks in, in the, the end of life. And I decided, oh, uh, something could be different here, mostly because I came from a culture that holds this experience differently. And I was practicing it in a culture that did not hold it in the same way I did. And I said, there has to be a different way of, of approaching this. And um, there was one family in particular, and I might've shared this story with you before, when I had gone to their house one day as case manager, and then I went back the next day and they were gone. And I started to call around in our little small town, where are you? Found them at one of our tiny little um, rural hospitals. And uh, as I, approach the hospital room where they were, his wife of 40, 50 years was pushed way up against the corner of the room, just terrified to get any closer. His son, who uh, had a psychiatric diagnosis of uh, schizoaffective disorder, was pacing around the bed in circles and not knowing what to do. And I stood on this side of the threshold of the doorway and somehow knew when I moved through the other side, that something was going to be different from me, for me. I didn't know what that would be, but I took the risk and moved through the threshold um, and then just practiced midwifery at the end of life. You know, I, I mentioned to his son, I said, you, you used to, you know, get your father up every day and shave him. It looks like he hasn't had a shave in a couple of days. Would you like to do that? And he just looked at me with, uh, you know, so much surprise and said, oh, I can do that? Oh, yes, yes. So I collected all the, the materials for that. And he, he shaved his father with such love. I've never seen a ritual so beautiful as that. And then I sat beside the bed and put the railing down and just sat and offered some loving attention. And then I felt his wife, you know, I felt a hand on my shoulder and it was his wife. And she said, C could I do that? I said, oh, yes, please. And so she sat in the chair and, and I just pulled back and sort of stood a little back, receded into the background and said, okay, we're done. And that's what a midwife does. She comes in, feels the field, supports what wants to emerge, and then moves to the next, moves on. So then when I left that room, I was holding a magazine and didn't realize I was holding that magazine. And at the very bottom, in teeny tiny little script, was uh, these little black and white letters that said, Spiritual Midwifery, Midwifery to the Dying, Frank Ostaseski. So that's when was my the liminal space between nurse culture and psychology and how I got here was to begin studying with Frank Ostaseski and the Meta Institute and he was the founder of the Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco and through the Meta Institute that phenomenal year of training I couldn't even call it training it was an initiation a deep initiation into this work uh, from a contemplative perspective uh, but that's when I met my mentor Charlie Garfield and and we were doing all of this amazing work in community together and yeah still remembering that one day after a workshop um, that we had finished and he looked at me and said you ready <laughs> I think it's time <laughs> so he's midwifing me out the door and into the next uh, experience and so there I was and finally uh, you know minted PhD and on my way and one day a colleague um, that I'd known for a while in the Society of Humanistic Psychology invited me to come teach terror management theory at Saybrook. So I was invited <laughs> and I think I was invited by the ancestors. I know my colleague would think that they were in, had invited me but I might have to say there was more than that. <laughs> and what a journey it's been. Yeah. See what happens when you ask a donde son? <laughs> You get all the territory. <laughs> and honest to God, I feel like I know Charlie Garfield better than Charlie Garfield knows Charlie Garfield. <laughs> You've heard a lot about him already, huh? I know. <laughs> I feel like I could go to his house and hang out with him, have a few beers, kick back on the couch. You know, it, it sounds like he's he was an amazing mentor and friend and guide and, you know, intellectual partner as much as anything. Is that fair to say? 
It's very fair to say. Very fair to say. If I was initiated to the mysteries of the end of life with Frank Ostaseski and all of the uh, faculty at um, the Meta Institute who were folks like uh, Ram Das, uh, Zoketsu Norman Fisher, Rachel Naomi Remen, Angelus Arian, um, just to name a few. There were so many. Stan Groff even used to come and was a, a guest speaker, the uh, teacher there. Charlie Garfield, though, was very special because he was uh, had a thon thanatology background was a psychologist and the founder of Shanti Project, as you all know. But what I always used to tease him about was because he, he was one of the guy you know, one of those mathematicians uh, on one of the Apollos. I think it was Apollo 11, the little white shirt and the little skinny tie, the pencil in his pocket. And I said, you always wanted to be an astronaut going to these, these places, these edges of unknown. And who would have guessed that you would have finally done that in this work that you are guiding me in? in the end of life because none of us know what's what's in the edges there so yes that's beautiful and and here's to the mentors and the 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 wonderful people out there i think it, we have to make sure we note here that dr belton is co-chair of the faculty senate here at saybrook university we've already in the introduction you heard that she's very busy as a faculty member dissertation advisor all those important things she also is council chair of our justice equity diversity and inclusion council and has really brought an interesting sense of renewal of spirit around this work. And I've been so impressed to see how that's evolved and to have been in the presence of our faculty staff and Gina, you uh, in doing that. I don't want to give short shrift to this. I think it's for another episode because I, I do want to talk today about grief and contemplative end of life care. But Maybe if we could spend a couple minutes talking about the work you've you've been thinking about doing in in practice around decolonization and and Jedi work. Maybe just speak to that from your own background would be interesting for just a few minutes if we could. It's not as far fetched as you would think um, because it is actually an aspect. I, and you know, I've had many conversations around that. How uh, my ethnothanatological work, especially as approach from a decolonial praxis, is work in social justice and actually has a very direct thread to thanatology and the concepts around that, particularly where Ernest. Becker's work is and terror management theory who basically uh, and that's a whole other conversation as you said but in a nutshell um, the thoughts around our death anxiety drives an awful lot of unpleasant behavior <laughs> and we watched an awful lot of that I, it's also a very um, incredible stimulus for creativity but creativity can be something magnificent Right. Um, and this and it can also be something malevolent, as we've observed. Humans are quite creative. Right. Yeah. The heart of what I do is to show up fully as a witness to love stories. That's one of the mentors um, reminded me of when I was working in hospice and grief counseling there. And grief support can be a rich and rigorous portal of entry to practivism. And so I say that I share that term with you because that relates to the work in decolonial praxis. Practivism is opening up to these liminal spaces where contemplative inquiry, creativity, and innovation meet as a liberatory practice, the way I embody it anyway. So you're holding practice, the academics, um, the artistry, so creativity, um, and activism. And as you said at the beginning of this question, you've worked with me a little while now and know what that means to me, that uh, just about every aspect of my professional expression is grounded in um, activism and a decolonial praxis. And as Indigenous scholar, that's something significant. And this is a good time to just barely touch on the fact that even decolonization has been colonized now as a term and as an epistemology by those scholars that are not Indigenous and who engage in what some of my colleagues recognize as spiritual bypassing, you know, where you don't don't really want to turn toward your own complicity in this relationship and so will take up and still center yourself as the non-indigenous scholar while trying to 
tell us <laughs> what it's all about. So I, I think it's fascinating and um, incredibly harmful because the, the real work that can be done in that uh, experience is being avoided. So when I have students and even my faculty colleagues uh, come ask me, I want to do a decolonizing or I'd like to research the, you know, decolonize this. My first question is always to locate themselves. You know, first I ask them to take a deep breath. Then we practice a don de son, and then I ask them to locate themselves in that relationship. And it's fascinating and beautiful and tender work. What folks who are not a part of the colonized aspect of that relationship find, even in just that brief moment, how tender that is, and that they've got a little bit to do before they can even pick up a pen, if that answers your question at all. <laughs> I mean, I think it does partially. I, I think for our audience, especially because there's so much discussion right now out in the national zeitgeist around anti-racism work and decolonization, maybe just even a core definition of decolonizing, decolonizing practice that might be helpful for the average person out there who may not be an academic. First of all, decolonization is not a metaphor. That's the thing we have to begin with. And that is something uh, that the scholars, Yang and Tuck, remind us of all the time. And if you can just start there, decolonization is a metaphor. It will hopefully invite uh, your cultural, intellectual, and epistemological humility just enough that you'll ask, oh, okay, if it's not a metaphor, then what am I really doing here? with this practice, right? And so I'm gonna reach up here because I want you to hear Michael Yellowbird's. So Michael Yellowbird defines colonization as both the formal and informal methods, behavioral, ideological, institutional, political, and economical that maintain the subjugation and exploitation of indigenous peoples, lands, and resources. So I can bet those folks who are not indigenous that are coming to us and saying, I'm gonna decolonize, probably haven't considered that that's what is part of this experience, right? So thus decolonization is the meaningful and active resistance to the forces of colonialism that perpetuate the subjugation and or subjugation uh, uh, or exploitation of our minds, bodies, and lands. Decolonization is engaged for the ultimate purpose of overturning the colonial structure and realizing indigenous liberation. So for me that, and I know you're gonna ask this question later, but let's get to it now for actualizing, realizing indigenous liberation. For me, that is a core tenant of humanistic principles, which is uh, actualizing potential. That's where the two meet. <laughs> so this is a teaser because, you, you know, Gina, we're going to have to have you and several indigenous scholars and community, community practivists out here to this podcast to talk about this in more detail because it is important for us not only to know what it is, but also know why it's work that institutions like ours should and can be doing uh, to support uh, the growth and development of all of our students, faculty, and staff. So I appreciate you taking a moment to diverge down that road for just a moment. Like you said, there's some interconnections. So you're, I don't want to call you the grief doctor, but I think I'm going to call you the grief doctor at least. Better than the death doctor. I've heard that one too. <laughs> I'm going to just get basic with you right now and what is grief? Grief is the healthy expected response to loss. And just as there are different kinds of grief, there are different kinds of losses. And some of the losses that are quite present in this moment as we are still navigating um, the impacts of the pandemic. Um, there's no post-racial experience, no post-colonial, and we're definitely not in a post-pandemic experience. So let's just rest there for a moment. So given that, there are non-death losses right? And we can think of quite a few of those um, experiences from the pandemic. There are secondary losses that are also related to grief. So those are things like when I'm ca caregiving, if, you're, if, the, if your beloved who has died was the primary breadwinner in your family, now the secondary loss compared to that can be resources. Um, housing insecurity can be an issue, uh, familial re relationships. It's, a, it's quite complex in that experience. 
patients? I think often when folks are attended to in hospice, I'm really pleased that they always remember to ask and explore what are the secondary losses that are occurring with, with this, this grief experience. Um, other secondary losses that aren't often noted is also uh, not just finances, friends and community, but sometimes faith and worldview. As you know, a lot of folks go, why did you, if they feel abandoned by their spiritual path. Ambiguous loss is one that I think we're going to get into a little bit here, um, which is quite important right now. Um, ambiguous loss is the kind of loss that you just can't quite define in a concrete way as you can the others. It feels um, very difficult to uh, provide a summary about because ambiguous loss happens when you're grieving somebody who could still be living. And you think of uh, other kinds of complicated trauma losses where things like, oh, what happened in Iran? You know, these are all the collective who are experiencing this ambiguous loss of what just happened with Mahasa who was shot. Yeah, lots there. You know, it's interesting, kind of take it from the general or the societal to the particular here. The George Floyd situation, uh, well, we won't call it a situation, he was murdered, but the the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, I wonder if you could categorize that almost as a, how would you count, as, as a secondary response to the larger long-term, long-standing grief that has been affecting so many people of color, Black people in particular, over centuries, and it, it came out in this massive set of protests and this ongoing work. I don't, I, maybe that's a terrible way to metaphor it. I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts? Well, it's not even a metaphor. You are right on point because I've had this conversation many times, not only in community, but also with our students, that Black Lives Matter is an ex- is a direct lived experience of all these mothers who have lost their children to police violence. And so in the time of the triple pandemics, when we began all of this work together and uh, we're first navigating the ambiguous losses of, of COVID, there were the very real, complicated, traumatic losses that were a result of, of the racial trauma that was occurring at in, in, in this time through police violence. And then, the, again, the other simmering pandemic underneath that with um, health disparities of who was getting the appropriate treatment and who also was dying and not dying from COVID at that time. But yes, so you think of, you know, on, on a more macro scale, uh, we're getting to issues of intergenerational trauma. So which of course can include, does include intergenerational grief. Um, I remember someone saying the other day when you are speaking, sometimes the tears choking you are not even your own, but the grief of other generations. And I can personally say, I, I know what that means and what that feels like. So that said, yes, that experience is a lived experience of a collective, intergenerational, traumatic loss and grief. So it's not even secondary, secondary, it's primary. Primary and collective, yeah, and traumatic. Mm -hmm. So there's healthy, uncomplicated grief, and then there's complicated grief. It's not a binary, so that's why you notice I didn't say unhealthy. (laughs) It's not that at all. (laughs) You know, on the individual level, I was spending some time in the introduction speaking about, you know, just personal associations with grief. I think we all have them, right? And I mean, obviously, um, what we were just talking about is one facet. You know, throughout my, I had this fabulous, like you're Charlie Garfield, the equivalent, right? And when he died, um, I had a grief response that I had. It came from nowhere, Gina. I mean, like, I don't know what it was. And it still gets me at this point. And I've had very close family members die, people I desperately would hate to lose and hated to lose. But this kind of arose in me like, wow. And, you know, as I've processed uh, over the years, I connected it probably to my own existential angst. I don't know, maybe narcissism of some sort. I have no, I'm not a psychologist, but and, you know, it, it strikes me as kind of connected to this, you know, we, we have all these prescribed ways of grieving, and I definitely was not in that prescribed way of grieving. And I wonder, because it shows up grief so differently for others, what are your thoughts on this? How How is it that the grief response is so radically, radically different on the context 
across individuals. I, I, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I'm curious. Well, it's a wonderful portal of entry, what you just you brought forward a really beautiful little jewel because it you can turn it over and over and offer the recognition of one aspect of grief and loss is attachment, which is again a whole other lecture. So the nature of the attachment has an impact on the nature of our experience of, of grief and mourning. Culture and context um, has a great deal to do with how we are experiencing our grief. Sometimes the culture and isn't supportive of our grief experience. And this is where you can think of things where disenfranchised grief. That's a kind of grief where um, folks, and we mentioned Charlie, uh, he started his work really in, in responding to the AIDS crisis. That was a nuclear bomb of collective, traumatic, complicated, disenfranchised grief. So if they weren't even a allowed to be seen and alive you know our queer brothers and sisters who were dying at that time they couldn't even be grieved so that's what was so magnificent about that quilt on the mall that was you know a collective group of humans just you will not deny my humanity i'm here so that's that's a cultural response to grief as well so it's it's as many humans as there are on this planet there are that many ways of of how we will grieve now there are some actual Actual theoretical paradigms that say over time we've observed certain patterns and so there's styles of grieving there's the instrumental style and then there's the intuitive style and some of us are one or more of the other and often a combination of both um, the instrumental griever is that griever who doesn't share a lot about what they're feeling and who are literally working through their grief they would be tilling the back 40 not saying a whole lot Right. When I was working with a client in hospice, I still remember she'd come in all, you know, dusty and dirty from working in the garden that she was, you know, just had that space was just hers as she was navigating the landscapes of the grief of her father, losing her father. And our whole year together was her working through that garden and her her grief, um, which was actually the impetus for an RC presentation that I gave to the, so uh, one of our students called an ecology of grief. Um, and then the in intuitive, as you can imagine, is a little more expressive. There are folks that do really well in a grief group and feel supported by sharing what they're feeling and exploring what they're feeling a little more. It's very tender as all grief is. The intuitive griever reminds me of when Robert Kennedy was grieving his brother when JFK was assassinated. I still remember seeing some of those black and white pictures of him sitting, just his whole posture just sort of moved inward and he's holding this book of poetry that he had written that it just supported him through his whole grief experience. And the only thing that could be helpful to him was to be in nature. And so he just sat, you know, by that river and cried and held that book of poetry. Well, and the beautiful thing, I think, about what you're saying, and this is something that, you know, I think we've all, well, I won't speak for everyone. I will speak for myself. There always this assumed prescribed way to grieve. A lot of that's balled up in religion and societal compacts and all that stuff. And I, re I really appreciate how you frame that. It, it, there is so much to be acknowledge that there are multiple ways it sounds like just as many in there are many human beings in the world like we have fingerprints there is many ways to grieve and to to be in that space and we do i know from a grieving perspective there's a lot of diversity in how we approach it we also do our best as human beings i think well a lot of us do avoiding death and dying that's terror management theory <laughs> right there <laughs> All the creative ways we avoid it. <laughs> and you've done a great job of kind of forcing the issue, I think, too, even at Saybrook. I, I remember my first faculty meeting. I sat there and someone in the back of the room, it was Gina Belton, I know, but now, but talking about becoming death doulas and death. And I'm like, what in the world is a death doula? Like, this sounds really out there. And then the more, <laughs> the more you and I talked about it, the more I'm like, well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, You've really kind of formulated this interesting specialization. We're coming, unfortunately, to the conclusion of our episode here, but I'd like for you to talk about for a moment, few moments about the contemplative end of life work you're doing. What is it? Why should students consider it? I'll, I'll, I'll stop stacking my question too far, but you know, maybe start there. Well, what's 
amazing, as, as you just pointed out, our, our time is nearly up because this is a conversation that is bottomless. And this is what I tell my students is once you turn toward the mystery, you can't turn away. And when you do, you recognize that it is a bottomless inquiry. And all you can do is, is just rest in between um, those moments of curiosity, right? And so, yes, there are. Uh, so from that perspective, um, what we are offering our students is actually an experience and end, end of life midwifery. So so from the archetypal perspective, the doula is the support of the midwife and the midwife is her own agency. So that is one of the things I'm quite inspired by in the contemplative end of life specialization is that we are cultivating the capacities and skills of our students who choose the specialization to be leaders and thought leaders in the end of life, wherever they are be they in a small rural community or sitting on a board or uh, in some position at the NIH or perhaps even uh, with the CDC. My hope is that their voices will be heard and they will carry themselves in that uh, position of straight back and soft front and uplifted heart that a contemplative approach um, cultivates in them. So why contemplative and not just end of life? Well, because there have been already, just like uh, the midwife uh, movement that occurred in the 70s, this was a groundswell from the ground up. Women wanting to have their babies unmedicated without trauma, or at least as little trauma as possible that had to do by medical intervention. Similarly, there have been how we die. Folks have been wanting to uh, have a similar way of having um, I don't want to say control, but more an active, a more active engagement and uh, support. And so in contemplative approaches, students are not just developing their attention, but it's the quality of their uh, attention, the quality of their intention, because these are all mind-body medicine students. So they're becoming already practiced in certain um, somatic practices, understanding the neuropsychology of stress responses and all of the research, the neurobiological research that complements and is a part of contemplative end-of-life care. And as many of the thought leaders like Joan Halifax, who are some of the authors they're reading, um, Cinda Rushton, Frank Ostaseski, Charles Garfield, all of those thought leaders are part of their learning now too, all teach that it's just not that you show up, but it's how you show up. And as Charlie always said, you show up, you pay attention, and you care. And if you want to tie this to a decolonial praxis, the very first lesson I teach students after Don de Son is the somatic practice, where, and you can join me if you like, put your hands like this. Rachel Naomi Remen has uh, shared that there are often only three, that there can be three views of the world um, and in the end of life experience. And if you see the world as a fix, I'm going to fix it. Look at that gap between I'm going to fix it and the one who's being told they're good. You're communicating to this beloved that they are broken and you have all the answers. And then there was, oh, what I call, oh, the head tilt. I'm going to help you. <laughs> you know, there's still a gap. They got a little closer, but there's a little sigh of condescension in that, isn't it? Oh, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. And it communicates weakness. I have all the answers and you are weak and disabled and your wisdom is of no use here. And I pity you, essentially. Yes. And so that's all ego-centered, both of those views of the world. And what we share with the students is this, which Naomi Remen says, serve. So when I show up heart to heart, meet you where you are in service, right? That's the contemplative approach in service to support what wants to be heard what wants to be seen, what wants to be witnessed. That's the contemplative end of life awareness. So that involves curiosity, right? Curiosity, humility, creativity, it's innov innovation. It's all there because it's an ecosystemic awareness. So you start with, oh, how can I know you? <laughs> Carl Rogers, for those who don't know, or the Rogerian, but not to just situate it with him, but it's that how can I help rather than here, I'm here to help and here's what I'm going to do. I'm from the government. That's right. I'm here to help you. 
and you will do this. And though, but he also came forward right with unconditional regard because that is also this, right? So can I can I show up? with that humility of unconditional regard. Well, I think you were the one that told me that he may have come up with it, but it, I think he may have pulled that from indigenous knowledge that... Oh, that's Maslow. Yes, Maslow. Yep, he took a teepee and our indigenous uh, world uh, view and flattened it into a triangle <laughs> and, and then called it a hierarchy, which is absolutely antithetical. <laughs> so yes, our founder is, one of our founders is guilty of that and we're acknowledging that today. Well, and actualizing from that point. <laughs> Curiosity though, on the contemplative end of life care, if we look at the students who come in, it, you know, it's ideal for anybody for sure, but I think particularly salient for maybe the nurse practitioner, the nurse, the psychologist, the doc, the, the physician, uh, other thoughts on that who, who would be most likely to apply and, you know, benefit from this? Well, I, I would imagine, and not only am I already seeing it, but I'll even refer back again to my first experience with the Meta Institute. It's right. The contemplative end of life specialization is right for the same folks who were in my cohort, uh, nurses, physicians, social workers, chaplains, hospice volunteers, uh, CEOs of hospitals. Be a wonderful thing for those CEOs. Yep, to have a certificate. See, so not only, maybe you don't have the role that you would want to embody um, fully as the end of life mid midwifery practice in contemplative end of life specialization, but if you take in the time to um, work on a certificate, it would certainly inform how you are caring for those who are vulnerable and dying in your environments of care. Right, because everybody's dying. And th those were the folks who were my colleagues in the cohort at the Meta Institute. And our students that I have right now are psychology students, nurses, volunteers, chaplains. I have a couple of chaplains. And, and family members who, who want to take a more intimate care of their family. I don't want to say better care because just showing up is a good start, don't you think? We all used to know how to do this. And then it was outsourced. <laughs> that's my. That's going to be one of my next studies. I, I'm fascinated as to how burden became such a, a entanglement in the Western view of the dying time. What? What? There's. It's quite a tangle. I know. I'm sure it's r wrapped up in the culture of capitalism and and the ethos of work at some level. I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You're not, if you're not available to work, if you're home taking care of your mother who has breast cancer. That's right. Well, we are, we've quickly come to the end, almost the end. And I have three more questions. So they're quick takes essentially. So my first quick take is what are three pieces of advice or one to three? We'll, we'll let you decide uh, for those uh, prospective students or learners interested in contemplative end-of-life care? What should they think about when applying to the university? Well, I think I would like to invite them to consider a little wisdom from Irv Yalom, uh, from his work, uh, Staring at the Sun, where many thanatologists do eventually arrive at this same space, where when we become inspired, uh, when we confront our own mortality, that's right, he says, when we confront our own mortality, we're then inspired to rearrange our priorities. And then we can communicate deeply, more deeply with those that we love, appreciate our life and the beauty of life more keenly, and we will be willing to take risks for personal fulfillment. I mean, you don't get any more humanistic than that for one. And if you're going to be taking risks, the risks necessary for personal fulfillment, why not take a risk and join us in contemplative end of life care where you can explore that deeply and with your whole heart and with others doing the same. All right. Next question. Quick take. What does the word or term humanistic mean to you? I feel I, I, I'm feeling the tension here a little bit around uh, um, I this year I take my seat as the president of Division 32, <laughs> the APA Society for Humanistic Psychology. So I go, OK, should I give the textbook of in the science and profession of psychology, humanistic psychologists recognize the full range of human and the richness of our human experiences. So we're dedicated to understanding that um, and hold the whole human and all of their lived experience, right? And all that said, I still come back to 
that beautiful little story of the actualizing oil can, the oil can that you're given when you take that seat, where the first president engraved on, or told the story that um, may we hold this oil can and remember to oil the soul of the American Psychological Association so they will always remember the heart of psychology. So what humanistic means to me is to listen from the heart and speak from the heart and act from the heart and to show up fully heart to heart. I was just saying to, to another interviewee, Dr. Serrato, like I have yet to have anyone mess that up. And you just gave a yet again, we're batting a thousand, a beautiful answer to that and see what she did there. She was sneaky. Everybody. She gave the formal definition. And then she said, this. I love it. That's great. That's a practice for you. <laughs> All right. And the last, very last question. And, and again, I really, uh, you know, appreciate your insights here. What are three things people can do right now to improve or enhance their mental health and well-being? Well, I have to speak from the location of my ancestors. And one of those first is to put your body outside and be in nature right? So connection, creativity, and compassion. Those are my three things, right? So with connection, I, I can't think of a more supportive experience when I am under a great deal of stress than sitting outside on the porch with my dog. <laughs> I know it seems very simple, but there are there's a there is a ton of research to support putting your hands in the dirt and having what I call an oxytocin hit. That's the whole point of connection. It's even a joke between my husband and I where I said, "Okay, 5 minutes obligatory oxytocin hit," which is literally a hug. So, connection, connection, connection. And there are lots of ways to connect. We can connect in, you know, one-to-one -one in that way we can connect but with literally putting our hands in the dirt um and i want to uplift the other way of connecting right now that just came out in an article from the american foundation of suicide prevention which is peer-to-peer -peer groups we're all experts in um being still we can be still and and listen right active listen so uh connecting with each other uh through peer-to-peer -peer groups is very supportive creativity it's my my dear colleague dr robert cleave uh we we just have found this amazing uh connection right now in in uh, contemplative life care and creativity and how that is just wide open for folks as a way of navigating this current trauma and uh, we're both mystified by maybe Maybe it's just a Western thing. I don't know, because it's not like that in my culture where folks are going, <laughs> oh, I can't pick up a pen and write a poem or I can't draw. Well, it's a little more. It's a little more than that. You know, creativity is what we saw with all this bread baking. <laughs> <laughs> right. So explore what that means to you. Nobody knows what that means except for you. So explore that. And then compassion is something that we're always um, speaking about throughout Saybrook. Um, but I want to put the emphasis on self-compassion. There's a great deal of science even there, too, that supports that we can just take a moment and offer ourselves some uh, a little loving. Oh, you did all right today, kid. Wasn't bad. You know, put your hand on your heart and say it was a good day. We did all right. We did the best we could. We'll get up tomorrow and try again. <laughs> That's pretty wonderful. Dr. Gina Belton, where can we find you on the web? Well, I'm still working on my website. Um, it has to be uh, reinvigorated, but you can find me on LinkedIn and social media under Gina Belton Palliative Psychology or LinkedIn Gina Belton. All right. So LinkedIn and also the Saybrook University website, the faculty profile page. Gina Belton, as always, we could talk for hours. We often have. I've always found these uplifting and just really nourishing, as you say. That word has in, in, in infected me. Like I say, nourishing and portal of entry. And they're like, you've been talking to Gina Belton. It's been great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long. Always great to talk with you. Well, we've done it again. Gina has kept the streak going of faculty members I could speak for hours with. She was fabulous, and I hope you enjoyed Dr. Belton as much as I did. Remember her three major takeaways, connection, creativity, and compassion. In terms of connection, get outside, connect with the earth, connect with your body, connect with others. In terms of creativity, explore what that means to you, whether it's writing or painting or something else. Just find out what that is and get creative. And compassion, 
engage in self-compassion. Take a moment to love yourself, to give yourself that self-affirmation that's so needed to help us keep moving forward. If you want to see the video segments on our YouTube page, you can find those things. And Phil Jean Grande has produced those for us. He's fabulous. And he's put those together along with the audio version of our podcast. And if you'd like to support that podcast, go to Apple iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review and subscribe so you can get episodes as they come out. Same deal with Spotify and make sure on Spotify you follow us. You can, of course, subscribe to us on most major podcast platforms, including Google, Stitcher, Amazon, Pandora, and many others. Remember to check our show notes for information on Dr. Belton, including any links to websites, books, and the like. And for more about our contemplative end-of-life care specialization or our mind-body medicine program or the university, go to www.saybrook.edu. Click on areas of study at the top of the page and locate the programs to learn more. Or simply Google Saybrook University, contemplative end-of-life care specialization. That's it for today powerful program. Wonderful, wonderful time spent with all of you. Thank you. Take care and be well.